video is brought to you by Audible. Visit audible.com slash Sarah Z or text Sarah Z to 500, 500 to get one month of Audible for free. In 2006, Mike Judge released a film by the name of Idiocracy. Taking place in a dystopian future hundreds of years after our own, the film centered itself around the premise that humanity was moving in a dumber and dumber direction. It told the story of Joe, an average human played by Luke Wilson, who was accidentally frozen for hundreds of years only to escape and discover a world that has become profoundly stupid. Essentially a fascist state largely propped up by megacorporations, the world caters to the lowest common denominator. Fast food, sex, and violence are the cornerstones of this society. People drink sports drink instead of water, legal cases are determined based on vibes, and everything is bigger, simpler, and more expensive. What I do is just say, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Most notably, because there are no more smart people, the world's problems seem to have worsened with no one around to solve them. Landfills pile up with no strategy on how to deal with them, no one remembers how to grow crops anymore, and the economy is in a constant state of decline. The film's release was marked with challenges. 20th Century Fox, the company producing and distributing it, seemed totally uninterested in Idiocracy's success. Fox allegedly felt that Idiocracy's premise didn't test well with audiences who wouldn't understand or appreciate its humor, or with advertisers whose brands were largely portrayed in a negative light throughout the film and so did little to no work promoting it. I was telling everyone, this is the big one, Maya Rudolph, Dax Shepard, all these guys. Got Steven Root, Mike Judge, it's gonna be great. The creator of Beavis and Butthead. And the rumor was is that we use because we use real corporations in our comedy. I mean, Starbucks was giving hand jobs, and these companies gave us their name thinking they were gonna get pumped up. All these real corporations were like, wait a minute. There were a lot of people who were like backing out, but it was too late. And so Fox, who was the who owned the company, the movies, decided we're gonna release this in as few theaters as legally possible. The studio allegedly considered continually postponing its release, trailers were not shown for the film, the studio released only two promotional stills for it, and it ran in only six cities across the United States. Despite its very limited publicity, Idiocracy released to generally positive reviews and gradually developed a cult following. In particular, it was praised for its incisive satire and social commentary. The film, which was written and released during the Bush era, was for many people the perfect encapsulation of a world run by its dumbest citizens, and its portrayal of for-profit healthcare and corporatocracy taken to a heightened extreme resonated with audiences. For years, Idiocracy remained a film that, while rarely on the list of viewers' best films represented a satirical look into American capitalism and Bush-era nonsense, and was generally well-liked by audiences that enjoyed poking fun at, from their perspective, the less intelligent. But then 2016 happened. Exactly 10 years after the release of Idiocracy, Donald Trump was elected president, and the return to Idiocracy as a cultural touchstone was massive. 2016 saw think pieces about how the film was not only incredibly prescient, but now essentially a documentary, with some of its absurd satire hitting a little too close to home. Judge, as well as most of the film's cast, were full supporters of this notion, with Judge in particular repeatedly remarking on how idiocracy had essentially become reality. He even famously remarked that the only reason he wasn't a prophet was because he was off by a few hundred years. In the words of film writer Eaton Cohen, I never expected hashtag idiocracy to become a documentary. Writers often pointed out parallels between the world of idiocracy and present day America, though usually through a series of out of context recaps about the film's plot. Particularly frequent were comparisons between Trump and the ex-wrestler president Camacho in Idiocracy, played by Terry Crews, though parallels were also drawn between the populace in the movie refusing to believe that water is better for crops than energy drinks and modern day climate change denialists. As Crews put it, the film is so prophetic in so many ways, it actually scares people. The 2016 election and ensuing, uh, everything cemented Idiocracy, previously a mildly popular cult classic satirizing life under Bush, as a cultural touchstone, and with it came the heightened prevalence of referencing Idiocracy less as an actual work itself and more as a concept. 
Idiocracy is literally a documentary has become an increasingly popular adage from members of all sides of the political spectrum, used in response to anything from Trump supporters existing, to Biden supporters existing, to people being woke and supporting social justice, to TikTokers being given war briefings, to just people making obvious jokes. Much like how people who have never read 1984 will frequently describe any governmental decision they disagree with as literally 1984, generally speaking, these people aren't necessarily referenced referencing specific events from Idiocracy or looking back at the actual film itself so much as just invoking its name as shorthand for People Are Dumb. On the other hand, a sort of counter-narrative to Idiocracy has emerged, albeit a smaller and much less dominant one. Writers like Vice's Rick Paulus and Salon's Adam Johnson are among the few mainstream voices to deeply examine the actual text of the film, with both writers mainly criticizing its eugenic sea overtones, which don't get me wrong, we're absolutely going to talk about. But I think there's more to discuss here about what Idiocracy is trying to say, what it actually does say, and how it fits into the mid-2000s cultural niche that produced it. With the mainstream public conception of Idiocracy having shifted from over-the-top satire to prophetic vision to cultural shorthand for anything people consider stupid, the film's actual text and ideology are often relatively unexamined mostly because a lot of conservatives using its name as a jab against progressives very clearly have not seen it and don't get that they are the butt of the joke for most of the film. But also, it goes far beyond that. Because as much as some progressives have praised it for its supposedly prophetic nature and bemoaned the state of the world as literally idiocracy now, and as much as the counter-narrative against idiocracy mainly critiques its implications of eugenics and not much else about the film, its actual text and message are actually very, very wrong about a large number of things. And so as much as I'm in agreement with general progressive sentiments criticizing political theater and unbridled corporate influence, I think it may be time for us to sit down and take another deeper look at the text of Idiocracy itself. Because as it turns out, it may be the case that for many more reasons than we think, Idiocracy is bad actually. Now, Mike Judge is no stranger to exploring the concepts of stupidity and ignorance. His big break was the show Beavis and Butthead, an MTV series primarily written, directed, animated, and voiced by Mike Judge. He would then go on to develop King of the Hill with a pre-Parks and Rec Greg Daniels, a show exploring the life of a blue-collar family in the town of Not Garland, Texas. He would then make his live-action directing debut with Office Space, a film about the mundane madness of white-collar jobs. All of these were popular and had positive critical and audience reception, and honestly, yeah, I get why. A lot of it holds up really well. But what's really interesting is thinking about why these things work and why Idiocracy doesn't. So let's look at Beavis and Butthead first. The show is about the titular Beavis and Butthead, two best friends who are essentially too stupid to function in the world around them. They care only about heavy metal music, television, and sex. A basic Beavis and Butthead episode is incredibly short, originally about 11 minutes long, and can therefore usually tell a self-contained story in a pretty succinct way. Episodes would find the two causing some kind of chaos in their town, with emphasis placed on how they made the lives around them worse. It's not everybody's cup of tea, sure, and there's almost a sure stuff that has aged poorly, but when it works, it does work, if anything, because of the way the episodes are structured. Beavis and Butthead are two characters too stupid to care about the nature of the world around them, and that's played for laughs against a mostly normal-seeming world. The humor, in turn, isn't just that the characters do or say something stupid, but the reactions and consequence that this has on everything else going on. It's two dumb characters in a sea of straight men, which makes the dumb antics funnier and also makes the wildness of anything else that happens stand out much more. Idiocracy, on the other hand, doesn't really get that because it's one straight man in an ocean of dumb, uncaring people. The joke becomes stale quickly because there's no real change in stakes in the world around the joke or how this affects the characters because theoretically the only character that could be reasonably affected or who could care about what's going on is just Joe. Beavis and Butthead episodes start simple and get more and more chaotic, but Idiocracy has to start chaotic and then keep being there. 
And then you have the fact that characterizing someone who is dumb or stupid as being unable to personally care about or have empathy for anyone else around them is a lot easier to stomach when you have two dumb teenagers who seem to lack empathy, rather than an entire civilization and class of people who do. Empathy is a really strong point here because I feel like it's what Mike Judge's work is best at portraying. King of the Hill has maintained a passionate fan base for decades now and has a warm reputation for the way in which it demonstrates empathy toward its subject matter. Rather than simply make a show that goes, haha, look at those dumb redneck Texans, it was an attempt to showcase exactly how mindsets like this work and why people are like this. The central conflict of the show often comes down to relatively conservative Texan Hank Hill's struggle with the changing world and changing family unit around him as he tries to raise a son who is gradually becoming more progressive and open-minded than him. And rather than simply portray the Texan characters as simple, mindless, intolerant assholes, it asks why someone could be out of touch with the rest of the world and what they can do to change and grow from that. King of the Hill wasn't always perfect. It's hard to be when there's over 200 episodes. There are definitely moments where it does essentially create political straw men, and there's a lot you could say about how it deals with race. But for the most part, the show always at least attempted to understand the issues going on and approach them with an open and progressive mindset. It is, at its heart, a very kind show. Why do you have to hate what you don't understand? I don't hate you, Bobby. I meant soccer. Oh, oh yeah, I hate soccer, yes. Which makes Idiocracy feel even weirder because it is a decidedly unempathetic movie, especially when it comes to the lower classes. Fundamentally, this is a film that is deeply uninterested in the root causes of the problems it examines. So the world of Idiocracy is, in effect, a fascist police state. <laughs> This should help you calm down. Please come back when you can afford to make a purchase. Your kids are starving. Carl's Jr. believes no child should go hungry. You are an unfit mother. Your children will be placed in the custody of Carl's Jr. Joe was arrested for not paying his hospital bill and not having his UPC tattoo. He would soon discover that in the future, justice was not only blind, but had become rather rich. As well. This is a world where individuals are forced to have identifying marks on them at all times, a world where at any moment they could be thrown in prison where they suffer horrific abuse merely for the act of being poor, a world with massive economic hyperinflation and misinformation, and altogether the film does not care why. The closest idiocracy gets to examining any kind of socioeconomic factors making the world the way it is, is in this scene here, where the film's narrator details why Brondo, the movie's equivalent to Gatorade, is served in all the drinking fountains and is used to water crops, having essentially completely replaced water. Brondo Corporation simply bought the FDA and the FCC, enabling them to say, do, and sell anything they wanted. And this is where it actually gets really interesting because there's an extended sequence describing how hundreds of years ago, the Brondo Corporation began to buy out various US government agencies like the FDA, using their newfound control over the government to spread propaganda and misinformation about the nutritional value of their energy drink while downplaying that of water, misinformation that is now simply treated like fact. This is genuine commentary, satire that exaggerates a real thing that actually actually does happen. Corporations and interest groups lobbying government agencies and using that to control the flow of information. This is a real thing that happens. Lobbying from the NRA is the primary reason why the CDC is unable to meaningfully research gun violence. The dairy lobby spends stupid amounts of money to exaggerate dairy's nutritional value and push for its treatment as a meal staple. Much like how Brondo is now the primary thing people drink, a combination of corporate lobbying and unsafe drinking water is both the reason why milk is a cheap staple drink for kids in schools and the reason you have communities in countries like Mexico that have a much easier time accessing Coca-Cola than water, often at massive costs to their health. Corporations utilizing government channels to alter the flow of public information is incredibly common, and to this end, I think this scene is an effective piece of commentary that does a good job of alluding to why the world is like this. The interesting thing about this, though, is that the film proceeds to do absolutely nothing with it. When Joe encourages the people of this world to start using water on crops again, we meet the CEO of Brondo, and he's just 
some guy. An idiot who doesn't know what any of this shit is and is scared. An emergency cabinet meeting was called with the CEO of the Brondo Corporation. How come nobody's buying Brondo the thirst mutilator? And the stock has dropped to zero? And the computer did that auto layoff thing to everybody? We're all unemployed! I think that makes the economy suck. Why is this happening? Hiring decisions on the company's part are made purely via artificial intelligence that seem to have been designed ages ago, presumably, or else who is, who is programming this stuff? The CEO is completely bought into the company's lies and seems more confused than anything else, and this character then immediately disappears from the rest of the film. He isn't framed as particularly standing to profit from Brondo replacing water, nor does he do anything to suppress Joe's attempts at bringing water back. That instead comes from the public, who have bought into the company's lies and have lost their jobs after its stock plummeted. A populace who are described by the narrator as stupid for being upset by this. When the Brondo stock suddenly dropped to zero, leaving half the population unemployed, dumb, angry mobs took to the streets, rioting and looting and screaming for Joe's head. The corporation, who we're briefly told literally altered the flow of public information to lie to people, aren't the primary actor driving this, nor are we meant to see them as malicious for doing so. Instead, we're invited to judge the populace for their stupidity for believing it, and it is the populace who do most of the harm here. This is the only time we're given an actual root cause for why a specific issue exists in the film. The rest of the time, whether it's healthcare is prohibitively expensive or the justice system is a broken farce, the answer is simply because people are stupid and this bad system is something a stupid person would come up with. It's the kind of lazy, self-congratulatory commentary on the world around us that fails to accomplish anything actually meaningful. As commentary on Bush-era politics, it's far more more self-serving than productive. Wow, the government sure is doing bad things, huh? This is the kind of thing a stupid person would come up with. They're dumb and that's bad. <laughs> well, that's not entirely true, because actually that may be a much too charitable read of the film. The real answer as to why the world is like this is explicitly, too many genetically stupid people are reproducing. That is the real answer that the film settles on. With no natural predators to thin the herd, it began to simply reward those who reproduced the most and left the intelligent to become an endangered species. So Idiocracy begins with a monologue laying out exactly why the world is as stupid as it is, and according to the text, the reason is because smart people don't want to have a bunch of children. Instead, they plan and wait for the right time. Having kids is such an important decision. We're just waiting for the right time. It's not something you want to rush into. On the other hand, stupid people are careless, sex-obsessed degenerates who can only focus on having as many children as they possibly can as quickly as possible. Oh shit, I'm pregnant again! Shit! I got too many damn kids! Thought you was on the pill or some shit! Hell no! I must have been thinking of Brittany. Brittany? No, you can't! There's even a scene where it's implied that, normally, stupid people would simply die of their own stupidity before being able to reproduce, but because of the wonders of modern medicine, they can be saved and continue to have children. Cleavon is lucky to be alive. He attempted to jump a jet ski from a lake into a swimming pool and impaled his crotch on an iron gate. But thanks to recent advances in stem cell research and the fine work of doctors Krensky and Altshuler, Cleavon should regain full reproductive function. Hands off my junk. Like, that scene is very much implying that the world would be a better place if that guy had died, right? An incredible message there. Besides the Brondo, I can't even call it a subplot, besides the brief mention of Brondo lying to people, this genetic dumbing down of the world is the fundamental building block upon which the rest of idiocracy rests. The poor governmental decisions are the result of genetically inferior people existing and being given power. Average citizens are easily tricked and lied to by Joe and Rita because they are naturally stupid. The people don't realize water is better than sports juice because they are simply naturally equipped with low IQs. In fact, the film relies very, very heavily on IQ as a measure of intelligence, referencing it often. The people who populate the world of idiocracy are not regular humans who are simply being exploited by corporations or by governments who do not care about them, but immutably biologically inferior individuals, implied to be the descendants of the people the movie considers, in our actual current world, to also be biologically inferior. 
There's a lot to talk about here. <laughs> because the film is a satire exaggerating the worst aspects of our current world, the entire satirical premise rests heavily on the notion that the world is bad because our current world's dumbest people had too many kids and our current world's smartest people didn't have enough. And so it's first worth examining who this film is implicitly claiming should not reproduce as much. Poor people. The, the answer is poor people. From the very beginning, the film's visual shorthand immediately associates stupidity with being poor. The opening scene depicts these smart, high IQ people who happen to have money for things like financial planning and artificial insemination and seem to be comfortable. They're dressed in nice, well-fitting professional clothing in well-lit, clean, upper-middle-class settings. Meanwhile, the low IQ people who are presented as the eventual cause of humanity's doom are depicted as, well, trailer trash, living in shitty, rundown houses, speaking with thick southern accents, wearing dirty, ratty clothing, and having bad teeth. The whole opening, whether intentional or not, begins with the implication that those who speak with perceived undignified accents or who don't have the money to invest in things like proper child planning or other systems are inherently dumber and therefore worse for society than the upper middle class people who can. The guys at Spectrum think I'm just some dumb hick. They said that to me at a dinner. It's not even just the opening either. The entire film hinges on that comparison. The world in the future is, well, trashy, literally. The world is littered with trash. People don't bother to clean themselves or change their clothes, really. People all tend to speak with a mock, dumb voice, the type of voice you do when imitating a teacher you don't like. People don't really care about science or knowledge or reading. The world is littered with terrible fast food chains and junk food, where people are portrayed as stupid for eating car Carl's Jr. and watching reality TV. These are portrayed as dumb things that dumb people do in the movie, but they also come with an asterisk in that these are also generally considered lower class things to do in our culture. And what this film doesn't understand, or at the very least doesn't care to address, is that a lot of these things are a byproduct of the socioeconomic factors a lot of low income people have to deal with. People who are poor are going to be watching a lot of trash TV and eating a lot of fast food because they're not in a position where they can afford much other entertainment and often don't have the time nor money to get food better than whatever giant chains are available in those areas. Low-income people who have a lot of kids often do so because of a lack of access to contraceptives and a lack of sex education in many southern schools and red states. Once again, the film fails to understand that the problem goes deeper than just stupid people like to slurp from the cum bucket. A lot of the factors that lead to people in these sorts of situations are factors outside of their immediate control, often the result of government interference and regulations, religious pressure, and even just the economic need to have multiple hands in the household in some cases. Stupid people aren't having sex because they just love sex more than smart people do, and poor people aren't having more sex than rich people because they love sex more and don't know any better. It's a weird connection to try to make, and the problem is that the movie hinges entirely on it. While we're here, the way the film views sex in general is a bit strange. Part of the thing is that sex is a major sign of sin, stupidity, and depravity in the future. We're supposed to see its normalization here as a sign that things are wrong and bad. The plot hinges on it being bad that dumb people are having sex. Everyone in the film is obsessed with sex, to the point where the big point of tension at the end of the film is hoping that Dax Shepard can hold himself from jerking off long enough to get footage of the grown plants. I like having sex with chicks. Yeah. I gotta take care of some business, baby, so I need y'all to wait outside. <laughs> Hey, a couple of us guys were wondering, uh, we go family style on her. And additionally, sex work is seemingly legalized in the future with laws regarding the transactions between sex workers and clients. We, we see this, for example, in Girl of the movie, whose whole thing is that she's a girl and the joke is that she's a sex worker and she is there with Joe, Rita, being arrested for not actually following through and scamming some random guy she was hustling. Most businesses offer some form of sex act with their primary service. Don't worry, though. We'll get her out on a work release whoring license as long as you're doing her. But the movie doesn't really explain why we're supposed to see this as a bad thing. Like, well, there could have been some commentary here on how businesses can exploit their workers and how the change to legalized corporation-controlled sex work is different than the current day, but nope. 
The joke starts and ends with the simple fact that dumb people like sex and dumb people are bad, therefore sex is also bad, except when it's smart people having sex. Then it's good, actually, and they should be doing it more. This is a film that is not only uninterested in the existence of socioeconomic factors, but actually hinges on the audience disregarding them. The very premise of idiocracy relies on socioeconomic factors having very little to do with why the world is the way it is. The film resolves itself not by the dumb populace recognizing that they are an exploited proletariat and advocating for better representation and living conditions, but by the dumb people learning to know their place and step aside so that a smart person can rule over them and make decisions on their behalf. Decisions that they are framed as being biologically incapable of making for themselves. The film needs Joe. Not only only is someone who remembers what the world was like 500 years ago and can show the people that they are being lied to, but as a person who is quite literally the genetic superior of everyone else and can therefore tell them what to do. If the people in Idiocracy are in any way Joe's equals, this film does not work, and so Idiocracy disregards any broader systemic explanations for the state of the world in favor of framing them as the product of immutable characteristics held by the general population that makes them biologically worse than the average person today. Not only that, but because they are the genetic offspring of our current world's cache of poor southern conservative individuals, the implication is, again, that those people live the way they do not as a result of those factors, but because of immutable genetic traits that they hold, usually expressed in the form of them having low IQ. This accomplishes several functions for the movie, and none of them are good. The first is that it frames the future stupid people, and by extension the present's low-income rural conservatives, as naturally inferior. Politically, this accomplishes nothing because it allows the viewer, of whom Joe is a stand-in, to feel superior to the individuals who are themselves marginalized by regressive policies, but not to recognize where those policies come from, who stands to benefit from them, or what can actually be done to remedy them. It casts the very individuals who are acutely vulnerable against the things that appear in the movie, say over-policing, or food deserts, or a lack of birth control, or everything being unaffordable, as responsible for their own subjugation. If we believe the people who experience those things are simply genetically hardwired to be worse than us, we not only forego empathizing with them or seeing them as possible allies with whom organizing is possible, but we in fact see them as both responsible for and deserving of the life they experience. I've already talked about how that erases the most culpable actors for the ways in which those people live. Indeed, oftentimes the living conditions in rural, politically conservative regions are the result of regressive policies, often born of gerrymandering and voter suppression, especially of people of color. There are a number of actors who benefit from the kinds of policies that screw people in those regions over. They don't just happen because those people are stupid. For example, the reason you have prohibitively expensive healthcare in the states in real life is not because the people coming up with policies that privatize healthcare are stupid, nor because the people who vote for those politicians are stupid. It is because powerful actors, especially private insurance and pharmaceutical companies, stand to financially benefit from healthcare's privatization. What this film would have us believe, however, is that those policies were invented as a product of stupidity. This not only ignores the influence of those powerful entities in favor of shifting focus onto the rural poor, but also implies the harm that they do enact is a result of stupidity and neither calculated malice nor financial incentives. In actuality, the powerful do not, say, make prisons horrible as they are in idiocracy because they are stupid. That is not a bad policy because stupid people designed it, it is a bad policy because we live in a capitalist system that prioritizes profit above all else and individuals connected to the private prison industry with a direct financial incentive to cram people into prisons designed it. They are not stupid. They know what they are doing, and they are doing it on purpose. So the implication that these kinds of policies the film is satirizing come from a stupid world and not from a world full of perverse incentives erases this root cause and makes it seem as though both the system's enactors and its victims are simply biologically worse than the rest of us. The film's second function is to tell us what ought to be done about it. 
Idiocracy tells us two things here, and both of them are bad. I briefly touched on the way in which the film resolves itself, by Joe, now the smartest man on Earth, becoming president and thus being able to make decisions for the rest of the country. With his ability to bring common sense back to people with ideas like use water to grow crops and don't flatten people with monster trucks for fun, the world slowly starts to become a better place. Again, because everyone in this movie is implied to be stupid in an immutable and fundamental way, Joe is really the only person who can be in charge throughout this. Every other person in the film, with the exception of Rita, who is there to be a hot girl, is not only the butt of the film's jokes, but is also unchangeably stupid. The other sidekick the film has followed Joe around is his lawyer, Frito Pendejo. Yes, that is his real name. It says here you uh, robbed a hospital. Why'd you do that? Yeah, I'm not guilty. That's not what the other lawyer said. He, like everyone else, is portrayed as a complete idiot, unable to understand basic concepts like which numbers are bigger than other numbers and why Joe is innocent of his charges early on in the movie. Joe ropes him into helping with the main plot via deception, and he never changes or grows throughout the entire movie. Even as he plays a pivotal role in the end of Idiocracy and helps uncover the fact that water grows crops, he does so completely accidentally and never has any sort of breakthrough moment where he demonstrates his ability to meaningfully retain new information or really grow. It's actually kind of odd because the film has this heartwarming moment in the end of them becoming friends, despite them having never bonded and us never learning anything about Frito as a person or seeing him grow beyond anything but the butt of the joke used to highlight how dumb the rest of the world is. Regardless, the introduction and continued depiction of Frito in this movie helps sell the fact that the people in this world are not only predisposed to be stupid, but they are unchangeably so, to the extent that even being present for the entire plot of the movie does nothing to alter Frito's stupidity. Joe needs to lead, because no matter how much education the people of this world are given, and no matter how much their circumstances change, they are worse than him and they will always be worse than him. The the implication for our real world, then, is that there exists a certain group of people who are stupid, and again, the way this film uses visual shorthand to indicate who these people are is fundamentally linked to poverty, and that those people will always be stupid and simply need to learn to shut up and let smart people tell them what to do. This is an incredibly common idea, one that we heard repeated all the time in the Bush era and again in the Trump era. Time and time again, support for regressive ideals in conservative regions is oversimplified into an issue of stupidity, with the prevailing idea being that what those people really need more than anything else is to simply learn their place and listen to the smarts. The smart will always biologically be smart and should rule, the dumb will always biologically be dumb and should obey. It's an easy trap to fall into when expressing frustration at the state of the world, but it's an insanely regressive ideal, one that directly ignores material conditions and tells the most exploited people who both in our own world and that of idiocracy are living in a world that is genuinely hostile to them and has serious ramifications, that they do not need liberation or political organization that makes it easier for them to have a voice, but instead that they need to shut up and do what they are told. Telling the people who are the most marginalized and excluded from systems of political representation that what they need is less of it is certainly interesting. Not only that, but because the root cause of the proliferation of the stupidity is very, very, very explicitly treated as not just poor people existing and holding power and making bad decisions, but reproducing too much and having too many kids, the film's implications for our only actual path forward are very, very dark and insanely regressive. That's also why Rita is in this movie, despite existing as nothing more than a hot girl for characters to leer at and make sex worker jokes at, because she is another person of biological average intelligence for Joe to reproduce with in the end and continue on the line of good genes. Let me be clear, there is a word for the implication that the world is made a worse place due to certain people below a specific threshold of intelligence reproducing on a large scale, and that the world would be a better place if safeguards were in place to prevent this from happening. That word is eugenics, and the ideology that idiocracy very proudly espouses from the get-go is incredibly supportive of this. 
The film has Joe give a nice little speech about how he wants to create a world where it's cool for people to be smart and read books. A speech that rings really hollow when we've just been shown via characters like Frito and via the narration that starts at the very beginning of the movie that the people in this film are dumb because of low IQ and that that can never be meaningfully altered. We then get some snarky narration noting the fact that Joe and Rita have a few smart kids at the end of the movie and Frito Pendejo has a bunch of really dumb ones. This continued implication that the world's problems are a direct result of immutably genetically stupid people breeding contains within it the implication that preventing this is the only way to curb those problems. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the continued legacy of eugenics, the ideas that idiocracy flirts with here are not in fact hypothetical. Much like idiocracy does, eugenic ideals typically rely on the idea of immutable generalized intelligence, often expressed via IQ, a concept idiocracy loves and makes constant reference toward. IQ itself is nearly a pop culture staple, with the idea of an objective numerical representation of one's general intelligence being constantly referenced in modern culture. It's ubiquitous enough in our collective pop science consciousness that I'm genuinely expecting outrage and backlash for noting that IQ is effectively complete pseudoscience. For one, the idea that there even exists an immutable general intelligence that individuals are born with for IQ to measure in the first place is incredibly shaky. This idea of general intelligence, sometimes called the G-factor, is typically born of the idea that, broadly speaking, performance on certain aspects of intelligence tests seems to be positively correlated with performance on others. Or in other words, people who are good at one part of an intelligence test generally tend to be good at other parts and vice versa. The conclusion people usually draw then is that there's some kind of central universal intelligence factor that you either do or do not have. The issue, though, is that there's never been any actual research success in finding this supposed factor. Researchers have proposed explanations ranging from brain size to the possession of some kind of central intelligence energy, but none of them have historically done a sufficient job at proving that this factor exists at all. We know some people perform better at intelligence tests than others, and we know that there exists variation in people's abilities in terms of specific areas like spatial reasoning, but what we don't actually know for sure is that there exists this immutable, central type of intelligence that you are born with that either exists or doesn't. The concept of general intelligence is often stated as fact in a way that kind of obfuscates this. Secondly, the idea that, should general intelligence exist at all, we can numerically measure it in a way that is accurate, objective, and free of human bias is just laughably incorrect. IQ as a measure of intelligence is an incredibly flawed one. The tests themselves are revised fairly often, about once a decade. The last time was in 2014, and before that it was 2003, and test scores themselves appear to be rising on average along with them. These are, at their core, imperfect tests, ones that have themselves been exploited by humans to engineer specific results and often generate support for racist policies. IQ tests tend to show significant gaps across racial lines, with black populations on average performing worse than white ones at the same test. This is a fact that's been historically used time and time again to disenfranchise black people. Louisiana, for example, used to employ an intelligence test that they forced some citizens to take before allowing them to vote. In practice, of course, black people were disproportionately forced to take it, and the questions themselves were often just short of complete nonsense designed to confuse rather than to actually measure any kind of literacy or intelligence. During the 1920s, low IQ test scores were largely blamed on both progressive social policies and on interracial mixing, and were used by its proponents like psychologist Carl Brigham to argue for greater levels of racial segregation and for the curbing of immigration. Even in the modern day, though, these gaps in IQ performance are often used to argue for some kind of genetic predisposition of black people to be less intelligent than white people. Books like Charles Murray's 1994 The Bell Curve not only makes this argument, but essentially makes the same argument as idiocracy. That IQ itself is the primary predictor of individuals' success in life, and that much of our current disenfranchisement can be chalked up to these IQ gaps. Incidentally, if you're looking for an incredibly thorough debunking of The Bell Curve, Sean has 
has a great video on the topic, which I'll link in the description. It's a far better takedown of a lot of these ideas than I could ever make, and I'd highly recommend you check it out. But in effect, IQ, despite its flawed nature, has been and continues to be used in support of racist policies and to justify current social disenfranchisement. It makes the claim that fixed and unchangeable general intelligence exists and can even be measured in this way. In actuality, IQ tests, one, can be studied for like any other test, thereby increasing your score, which in itself really debunks the notion that it measures any kind of fixed quality in a person. Two, is largely influenced by an individual's environment, which is why you actually see increases in IQ test scores when children are adopted into higher income homes where they have access to better nutrition and education, and why we might see lower results among racial groups who tend to, on average, experience not only greater poverty, but also greater discrimination and are also not generally the people designing these tests. And three, once again, show results increasing by about three points per decade, which would not be happening without a society that changes en masse. Especially notable with regards to perceived racial gaps on intelligence tests are two factors, cultural awareness and stereotype threat. The first indicates that some tests largely measure cultural awareness rather than an objective body of knowledge connecting to intelligence, leading people who are not members of the cultural groups designing those tests to perform worse on them. The second is the concept of stereotype threat, which suggests that individuals who are aware of negative stereotypes pertaining to their intelligence are less likely to perform well on intelligence tests, largely as a result of the anxieties associated with those tests. In fact, we've seen numerous studies wherein groups of black test takers were given intelligence tests, and the groups that were not told the tests measured IQ actually performed performed better, suggesting that something about knowing they were taking an IQ test directly led to worse performance. Along with cultural awareness and test design and how the stress and trauma of marginalization at a young age can impact a person's development, the concept of stereotype threat suggests a direct causal link not between the natural intelligence of people of color and their test performance, but actually a link between test performance and racism. Even with the most culturally aware tests, this is a very difficult gap to surmount, and makes it clear that these tests and testing cannot be considered objective measures of general intelligence on their own. And to be completely frank, we can't divorce any of this discussion from the very real fact that these tests have historically been used in service of horrifically racist and ableist policies in general, and specifically in service of eugenic policies. What does that look like in practice? The most obvious one is that of forced sterilization. It's one that idiocracy never explicitly advocates for, but by not only relying on IQ, but also making the argument that social problems result from dumb people breeding too much, it at the very least flirts with. In actuality, women have been subject to policies of forced sterilization throughout the US and Canada for a variety of reasons, and poor performance on IQ tests is just one of them. In 1895, a law was passed in Connecticut preventing people considered mentally deficient from marrying one another, a law designed specifically to curb childbearing among those groups. In 1907, Indiana was the first state to pass a law allowing for, in the words of author and eugenics expert Adam Cohen, forced sterilization of people judged to have hereditary defects. In 1924, the state of Virginia mandated sterilization of individuals found to be intellectually disabled, explicitly for the purpose of improving the gene pool. An 18-year-old girl named Carrie Buck, who was living at an institution for people found to be mentally disabled and who had already previously given birth, was mandated to be sterilized explicitly on the basis that her continued ability to have children threatened the genetic fabric of society, and her case was used as the prototype for eugenicists to further argue argue that this should be made a widespread policy. Buck's lawyer was himself a eugenicist who made a very poor case for her, and she was found to be literally unfit to reproduce. Not only was she forcibly sterilized, the precedent the case set allowed for this to happen to 70,000 other people who were considered mentally disabled after the Supreme Court ruled that Buck's forced sterilization was constitutional. It was, in fact, these American policies of eugenics that served as the inspiration and building blocks for similar 
similar and worse policies overseas, particularly in Nazi Germany. In 1933, after Nazi Germany adopted a law allowing for government councils to decide which individuals deemed mentally deficient were and were not fit to reproduce, American eugenicist Harry Laughlin published a paper by a Nazi scientist bragging about how Germany learned from the US. In fact, the case of Buck v. Bell was actually cited by Nazis in defense of their own policies when they were placed on trial at Nuremberg. Similar forced sterilization has occurred numerous times throughout Canadian history as well, especially to Indigenous women, who are often still pressured into it to this day. Once again, the use of intelligence tests as a justification for this is long-standing, with the reasoning explicitly being that the continued ability for low-IQ individuals to reproduce is harmful to society and is the root of numerous social problems. And this argument is the exact same one made by idiocracy, that the continued ability for low-IQ individuals to reproduce is harmful to society and is the root of its social problems. So not only is this argument dangerous because of the way it obfuscates those social problems' real causes, and thus achieves nothing in a political sense, but the film is also very explicitly eugenicist. I don't necessarily think Judge set out to make a film that acts in support of eugenics. He was asked about these critiques as part of a 10-year anniversary interview and essentially expressed that he didn't intend to make a eugenicist movie and that the opening of Idiocracy argues that both a combination of nature and nurture led to the world being as stupid as it is. In Judge's words, I obviously don't believe in eugenics. I think you could look at it both ways. You have this couple that's trying to be so responsible that they end up never having kids. Then there's another couple who just irresponsibly keeps having them and not raising them right. So, you know, if the other couple adopted the other kids, I'm sure they would probably be better off. I believe Judge here when he expresses that this wasn't the intent, but regardless, the film very explicitly not only makes the case that the worsening of the gene pool exists and is bad, but also that it causes the real-world social problems that the film repeatedly exaggerates and satirizes. When Judge makes the argument here that the other people in the film, the ones portrayed as dumb and irresponsible, keep having them and not raising them right, he is again attributing this to the same natural biological factors that the rest of the film does. He portrays the solution to this problem, one that the film, by the way, does not propose, as simply having responsible individuals raise the same children who are nevertheless still biologically inclined to be stupid, as per Judge's argument. This not only disregards the aforementioned socioeconomic factors in favor of the claim that some people are simply naturally inclined to be bad and stupid, but only deepens the argument that the groups portrayed in the film are inherently unfit to raise children. When you have real children who are actually taken away from their homes as a result of neglect stemmed not by malice or stupidity, but expressly by poverty rather than attempting to fix the root causes of those issues, you can see why implicitly advocating for this is especially dangerous. And rather than analyze why one couple might be unfit to raise children and address those base issues, this instead suggests that some demographics of people are just naturally better parents. And so, while I do not think Idiocracy as a film is intentionally eugenicist, the very premise on which the movie hinges, and thus the premise Judge is still defending here, even unintentionally, nevertheless continues the long and incredibly storied legacy of real-world eugenics. Idiocracy is fundamentally, explicitly, a film steeped in a eugenicist premise and eugenicist arguments. This issue is deepened by the fact that the film very closely ties these characters' kindness and empathy to their intelligence. The way Idiocracy presents them isn't just as dumb, but almost seemingly incapable of being human. Most of them lack a basic understanding of the world around them, don't seem interested in anyone else, can't keep attention for longer than five seconds, and most worryingly, display almost no empathy or compassion for other people. There are few, if any, moments in the film where a character shows sympathy toward Joe and Rita, or any sense of understanding or connecting with them on any deeper level. Do you really want to live in a world where you try to blow up the one person that's trying to help you? Once again, it's worth acknowledging that this is a very real stereotype about intellectually disabled people, and whether or not the film's characters are expressly intellectually disabled, this still continues that perception of them. This is especially clear with Frito, as although his character is supposed to become a good friend of our leads, he doesn't really seem to care about them. He gets roped into the plot for money, and by the end of the film, he's still in it for money. He doesn't care about anything going on. Nobody besides Joe and Rita show any care for anything because they're 
they're just too dumb to think to do that. Besides the horrifying implications of this film's politics and the very mean and unempathetic way in which idiocracy treats its subjects, this is also notable for how very dated it makes the film feel in retrospect. Despite many of the claims that this film is more relevant now than ever, Idiocracy really feels like a perfect encapsulation of mid-2000s culture. For one, we've already talked about the strange way this film treats sex, and I would be remiss not to acknowledge that that is because Idiocracy is really a product of its time. This was the age where a wave of sex comedies, including the likes of American Pie, 1999, Old School 2003, also starring Luke Wilson, and Eurotrip 2004, was reaching its burst point. The fifth American Pie film was released direct-to-video a few months after Idiocracy's limited release. This era saw a lot more raunch and, paradoxically, a lot more slut-shaming in the media, and the concept of hypersexualization was on everybody's minds. Things like Starbucks offering full-body lattes serve as that perfect time capsule of an era where restaurants like Hooters culturally mattered, and we all thought that Starbucks was terrible not because of their consumer practices or anything moral, but rather simply because they were popular which was a very, very common way to view Starbucks in the late aughts. The very mid-2000s nature of Idiocracy also extends to the ways in which this film treats slurs. Joe was able to understand them, but when he spoke in an ordinary voice, he sounded pompous and f***y to them. It says on your chart that you're fucked up. Uh, you talk like a f***g and your shit's all f***ed. Okay, number one, your honor. Just look at him. <laughs> He talks like a f too. <laughs> On one hand, the film is providing semi-progressive commentary on the ways in which slurs should and shouldn't be used. Um, so the R slur and F slur are used repeatedly by people from regular everyday Joes to higher members of government. Idiocracy really is a product of, and is commenting on, an insanely homophobic era where it took incredibly little to be labeled as gay and accordingly bombarded with slurs and violence for the most minor deviations from social norms. The film clearly views this as not okay, and we're supposed to judge the characters for using these slurs so liberally and see it as an expression of their stupidity, which is, you know, more progressive a sentiment than most comedies at the time were attempting. Characters are frequently cast as idiots, as the butt of the joke, for defaulting to homophobia instead of making intelligent points. But at the same time, a lot of the humor is derived from the fact that a slur is being said without real commentary on the use of the word or why it's bad or anything of that sort. The film even ends with Joe saying the F slur in his presidential speech in a moment meant to show how he's acclimating to the culture and appealing to the common man. Really, when you get down to it, the movie sees the slurs as bad not because of the fact that they're words with a long history tied to discrimination, homophobia, ableism, and abuse, but rather because they're dumb words that dumb people love to say, so of course they're being used, and it's funny that they're saying it because they're dumb. In fact, part of the comedy often comes from the irony that the people Idiocracy understands to be low IQ are calling things the R word. The joke at many points then seems to be that it's ironic that they're calling things the R word when they themselves are so stupid. So while it's true that we're not supposed to see the use of slurs in the film as a good thing, using them for comedy without a clear indication of the power and history of the words being used and framing them mainly as one, funny, and two, said by dumb people not because of bigotry but because they are dumb, makes it fundamentally not much different than using it as a joke in the same way the characters do. This is all why it's so strange to see Idiocracy being described as a documentary, or finally coming true, or ahead of its time, because it was never ahead of its time. It was always a reflection of culture in the 2000s. It was very much commentary on that specific moment, and most of its humor comes from commenting on things that we in the 2000s thought were culturally important. It is very much a product of the dude-bro vulgar comedy era of the late aughts. Even looking at its DVD cover, which feels right at home with the era of direct-to-DVD American Pie and Van Wilder sequels. But beyond that era's comedy, it's also a representation of its political climate. Idiocracy was written in the midst of the Bush administration, and it's very noticeable. This was a time when anti-Bush sentiment was approaching a high, when the viewpoints of modern culture was that Bush was a dumb Texas frat boy who had gotten America wrapped up in conflicts that people didn't fully understand or care about, and that he didn't fully understand or care about. It was the time of the Iraq War and Hurricane Katrina, where people could see the ways in which their nation's leaders 
were failing and actively endangering their own people. When viewed from this lens, idiocracy makes a lot of sense, as it's clear that its view of dumb, poor people ruining the world is expressing the worry that the current political leader is going to fuck up the entire planet solely because he's too stupid to actually care or know any better. It's also a good representation of that time politically because it perfectly conveys that era's level of smugness. The 2000s were an interesting time politically, a time controlled largely by conservative powers. And not to stereotype a whole subset of people during this period, but it was a period of a lot of liberal smugness in response to that. There was this prevailing attitude of superiority against conservatives, not just morally, but also intellectually. And you can argue that this is the case, that leftist talking points can often be backed up by more research and are supported by studies and whatnot, but the problem is that this can also create an after effect of not just assuming that you are smart, but also assuming that your own opposition is dumb. This was the era that brought us Jon Stewart's Daily Show, The Colbert Report, and most regrettably, Real Time with Bill Maher. I'm not going to say that these programs were all bad, though Bill Maher is, but rather that they're representative of the attitude a lot of progressive media had toward Bush and the US Republican Party during this time. A lot of the humor and commentary derived not from carefully picking apart what the other person was saying, or arguing against them, or standing up for the people hurt by the right, but rather pointing out how silly and stupid and dumb conservatives are. A lot of humor back then was simply playing back things that Bush or some other conservative politician said and then guffawing about it and commenting on it as if it's mystery science theater. The McCain-Palin campaign is spreading the love to all the middle class. Joe the plumber and Ed the dairyman. Rose the teacher and Phil the bricklayer and Wendy the waitress. Jane the engineer and Molly the dental hygienist and Chuck the teacher. I believe they went on to single out Bob the Builder, Dora the Explorer, and Thomas the Tank Engine. Governor Bush, do you agree with that? Yeah, I I'm not so sure the role of the United States is to go around the world and say this is the way it's got to be. Hmm. All right, well that's interesting. Um... I give people the truth unfiltered by rational argument. I call it the no fact zone. Fox News, I hold a copyright on that term. George Bush is the crazy person we need to keep an eye on. He needs to stop taking money from the pharmaceutical lobby and start accepting samples. <laughs> Do you have trouble organizing words into a coherent sentence? <laughs> Do you hear voices that aren't really there? Like, oh, I don't know, your imaginary friend Jesus. Idiocracy falls into this same trap. Rather than apply any meaningful systemic, cultural, or socio-political critique regarding the state of the world, the government, or how people end up like this, it instead wants to be a celebration of not being like that. Literally creating a world in which a basic average guy is treated as the next second coming because he happens to be smarter than the idiots he's surrounded by. There's a through line between the attitude shown off in Idiocracy and future displays we would see like 2010's Rally to Restore Sanity. It's a through line that, to be honest, has continued to this day, which is where you see YouTube series consisting simply of asking Americans questions and then cropping all the dumb ones together and making fun of them. Does anybody in this rally know what the fuck they're talking about? Are you a doctor? No. Are you a doctor? I'm not a doctor, no. No, I'm not a doctor. Are you a doctor or a medical professional? Nope. No? You, no, you I'm, just... I'm in the natural therapies. Are you a doctor? No, not at all. I've got a Trump pamphlet here, but I've replaced all the quotes with Hitler quotes. Great liars are also great magicians. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, uh, I think that, you know, he's going to lie in any way, pro probably to, like, support the country, to keep the country going. Trump gave permission for racists to come out of the closet. But now this whole vaccine stuff and mass stuff has given permission for the crazies to come out of the closet. So if the other guys took off their hoods, these guys took off their straight jackets. So now they're going around going, I know better than all the scientists in the world and all the doctors in the world. Oh, it's gonna make you sick. <laughs> Some people do not buy into that because they did a Google search and Jenny McCarthy popped up and she had clothes on. So they listened to what she had to say and decided not to vaccinate their kids. Now, and by the way, 
This is also why you saw a lot of the idiocracy as a documentary takes right around the beginnings of the Trump administration. Much like Bush, Trump was also characterized as being incredibly stupid, not knowing what words are, not able to control himself, the lowbrow idea of what a rich person is. This was the time when Trump would tweet something out like Kafifi and we'd all clown on him and talk about how he's so dumb and how silly it is for the president of the United States to tweet out a typo. Despite the constant negative press, Kofefe. Despite the constant negative press, Kofefe. <laughs> This is the part of the assisted living facility commercial with, <laughs> where the grown-up children say, that's when we knew dad could no longer live on his own. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. It was only natural for people to see the similarities in idiocracy as they entered a similar political climate once again. But ultimately, the return of this kind of mindset, harmless as it may seem, spells something sincerely concerning for the way we look at our opposition. It allows us to imagine a world that is fundamentally broken, not because powerful actors are at work making it this way, but because we are simply better than other people and always will be. Ironically, despite being an anti-conservative government narrative, it's one that encourages complacency within them because instead of stoking any real change, it instead teaches us that this this change is impossible to strive for. There is no meaningful praxis that results from telling the average vaguely progressive individual that we are fundamentally inclined to make better decisions because we are naturally better. It's just an easily digestible platitude designed to make us feel superior but not motivated to enact any real change or identify the deeper sources of inequality and dangerous policy making. It makes us feel good and doesn't accomplish a single goddamn thing otherwise. Also, it just makes us look like twats. Everyone who's like that is so fucking unbearable to be around. <laughs> look, make no mistake. Trump is fucking stupid, and in a lot of ways Bush was too. But to portray them all as imbeciles whose policies are the result of their own stupidity is to miss the point that these administrations and these governments as a whole were deliberately structured, motivated attempts to seize as much political capital as possible, strip away rights from minorities, and harm as many people in other nations as they could. The Bush administration was dangerous, and Bush being stupid or a dumb hick was the least of the problems there. The main problems were instead the untold amounts of harm that administration did toward people both in the states and overseas. Trump may be dumb as shit, but his administration caused a lot of pain and suffering for minorities and immigrants, and some people won't ever recover. It doesn't matter if the person at the front is dumb, because there's always people making concentrated and calculated efforts in order to benefit themselves and hurt the people they dislike. Not to mention the fact that stupidity is not itself the root cause of bigotry. There are a lot of people who are very well educated, who are very well spoken, who are not the very smart mid-2000s liberals perception of a stupid person who in fact will act repeatedly and deliberately to enact bigotry against the people they dislike. Similarly, you have people who are not necessarily well-educated who may themselves be the exact stereotype of person idiocracy is trying to portray, who are incredibly kind and compassionate individuals who don't possess bigotry toward one another. The link between stupidity and bigotry is one that was incredibly popular to make during that time, is still incredibly popular to make, and is one that the film makes itself, but is in and of itself just not correct. That erases where bigotry comes from and gives us a very skewed perception of what a bigot looks like and why they believe the things they do. That's why this film's President Camacho is not really a good metaphor for Trump. Camacho in the movie is dumb, but seemingly well-meaning, wanting to help his people and willing to accept new ideas if it means bettering his society. His cabinet is, at worst, uncaring and unprepared for what they're about to do. Even the people who pay off the government, Brondo, seem at this point to be too stupid and ignorant of actual science to understand that what they're doing is wrong. They are, at best, well-intentioned idiots. 
But the real world is not like that. Gas companies have known about climate change since at least the late 50s and have repeatedly paid off politicians to turn the other way. Politicians pass and support bills they know are both unconstitutional and unethical solely to pollute political discourse no matter how many minorities they hurt in the process. You can joke about how dumb and unenforceable trans bathroom bans are and how ex-politician clearly doesn't understand how this will practically work, but do you think they care? Their goal is to spread hate and harm the people they wish to harm, and that's what they're going to keep doing. Some see the lack of an all-out bad guy in Idiocracy as a sign of the movie's nuance, that it refuses to outright condemn or vilify anyone, and instead extends grace to everyone at the end. But not only is this not true because of the ways in which it portrays lower-class people, the refusal to really vilify anyone, or anything, or any system beyond just being stupid means that it misses the mark on being any actually effective social commentary because it's not really commenting much on anything. If anything, its usage of eugenics as a setup makes the movie feel more pessimistic overall. It presents to us a world that can never truly change because people are too genetically stupid to better themselves on their own, and our only hope is two smart people repopulating the world Adam and Eve style. Weirdly enough, there, there is an actual movie in which an average guy in a consumer-driven, dumbed-down, propaganda-filled world is placed in a position of importance over everyone else and has to deal with going from being a normal person to a supposed savior of humanity. It's called The Lego Movie, and it actually manages to tell the story of idiocracy better than idiocracy. It has an actual understanding of how the flow of information can be utilized in order to pacify a population from seeing the issues in the world around them, and that said methods are often utilized in order for those in power to maintain it. It's also just a better movie, let's be real. But for an even more direct comparison, if you want a piece of adult media that's as much of a social satire and vulgar comedy as Idiocracy, look at Sorry to Bother You. Much like Idiocracy, it came out in the middle of a divisive conservative American administration and comments on American culture and social issues at the time. It takes place in a world much like our own, but with exaggerated differences in order to satirize our current reality. It showcases a world in which capitalism and corporatization have expanded to a absurd degrees and have made most of the population ignorant and compliant. And much like Idiocracy's Ow My Balls and the Lego movie's Honey Where Are My Pants, Sorry to Bother You has its own fake mindless TV show, I Got the Shit Kicked Out of Me. The thing that makes Sorry to Bother You not just better than Idiocracy, but an excellent movie in its own right is that it does deeply understand how capitalism ruins society and how intentional that process is, and it satirizes it brilliantly. The film starts with Cassius Green taking a job at a a call center and continues in absurdity until he's selling weapons of war and actual people for profit. And when you do meet Army Hammer's Bezos-inspired character later on, he's clearly an idiot, but he's also one who knows what he's doing. He's fully aware that he's manipulating those around him into selling off their souls and signing their lives into horse people slavery. That sounds buckwild, but it makes sense in context. Watch the movie, it's great. The point of the world in Sorry to Bother You being stupid isn't the fact that the people are naturally biologically dumb, but it's an actual commentary on how corporations with a direct interest in doing so have ruined this world. Frankly, if Idiocracy wanted to succeed in the same way Sorry to Bother You does, they should not have framed the Brondo Corporation as run by an idiot who is completely bought into his own propaganda and has no real understanding of what's going on or seeming interest in continuing to deliberately lie to the public. The company did not need to be run by a bunch of calculating super geniuses, that isn't true to life either, and the idea that these CEOs are just naturally smarter than everybody else is also propaganda, but they should have stood to benefit from their concerted campaign of lying to the public and have known this and acted accordingly. If they wanted this to be an effective metaphor for the actions of oil companies or an effective critique of corporate lobbying in general, that needed to be present. Otherwise, you run the risk of framing stupidity as the driving motivator for corporations misinforming the public, rather than getting at any deeper systemic critiques of capitalism and how a system that prioritizes unfettered growth at all costs is necessarily going to incentivize the destruction of many ways of human life when they get in the way of profit. But by accurately placing the blame on capitalism, we're forced to admit that these situations are systemic and do not simply arise because people are stupid, quite the contrary, actually, and we're no longer emboldened to feel good about our own intelligence at the cost of creating any real change. Unsurprisingly, then, the film didn't go in this direction. 
I think the thing that gets me about Idiocracy and all the takes about it is that not only is it not great from a commentary perspective, it's also just not really a very good movie in its own right. Like, at my most charitable, it's fine enough so long as you ignore some of the bad politics in it, but even then, this isn't a comedic masterpiece or anything. The characters are pretty flat and one-dimensional, the jokes are often the most cheap and obvious ones you could go for in any given situation, there's no real sense of plot escalation, none of the characters get any real development until the very end where we're simply told that Joe learns to love it here and he and Rita get together. The only joke with any real staying power that people quote from this movie is the Brondo line because it's meant to be a mimetic slogan, but otherwise there's not really many jokes that hit particularly hard or anything. Brondo's got what plants crave. It's got electrolytes. But Brondo's got what plants crave. It's got electrolytes. It's very telling that the only thing people regularly reference about Idiocracy is the premise, because the meat of the film itself doesn't offer much besides that. I think what we can take from Idiocracy, though, is that this way of referring to our political opponents is a long-standing and very popular one, and I think Idiocracy is, unintentionally, a perfect case study into why this way of thinking is incredibly dangerous. The discourses that Idiocracy utilizes are discourses that are still popping up in our current day, and with the of things like, say, trans bathroom bans currently sweeping the United States, we're seeing a lot more generalization of people who live in those regions and the people who are enacting those laws as dangerous because they are stupid, and I think that's something worth pushing back on. Idiocracy very strongly encapsulates a lot of very dangerous ways of viewing the people who enact harmful policies and the people upon whom those harmful policies are enacted, and I think what we can take from Idiocracy is by viewing it as essentially a concentrated representation of things we need to avoid in our own political discourse. Beyond that, if you want a film like Idiocracy, watch Sorry to Bother You. If you want to work by Mike Judge exploring the absurdities of modern culture, watch King of the Hill or Office Space. If you want a piece of comedic media that explores the absurdities of 2000s political and popular culture, watch the first three seasons of Arrested Development. There are better options out there than Idiocracy, ones more relevant, with more to say, and overall just better. Because the film itself is flawed, full of bad, tasteless politics, and not even completely relevant when it comes to examining the current climate we find ourselves in. It uses flawed, extremely problematic science to justify presenting a world in which those who are poor and have an arbitrarily low IQ number are not just dumb, but dumb to the point of ruining society and incapable of basic empathy. It's an ultimately mean-spirited, poorly-aged relic of its era, rather than some prophetic statement about the future. I think my feelings on this film, especially on a rewatch, were really crystal crystallized by experiencing better media like Sorry to Bother You. And one of the things that really sealed it for me is that, and if you follow me on Twitter you'll know this, but I've been deep diving into the Discworld series by Terry Pratchett as of late. A series that, on top of being empathetic, humorous, exciting, and just genuinely really fun to read, deals with class in a really thoughtful and great way. If you've ever seen this quote circulate around social media, essentially explaining why it is quite literally more expensive to be poor, that's actually by Terry Pratchett, and it's from his Discworld novel Men at Arms. So basically Discworld is this series of interconnected stories taking place in this really creative and inventive fantasy realm. I had honestly been a bit intimidated to get into them because the series seemed really huge and daunting, but I started with the audiobook of Mort, a story of a young boy who becomes Death's Apprentice and absolutely loved it, and I've just been devouring them ever since. If you want a Discworld book that really touches on the same themes of class and education disparities that I've talked about in this video, I'd personally recommend Unseen Academicals, the story of a wizarding university establishing a football team, or a soccer team if you're North American. It's not only a satire of the sport itself, but also really touches on class divides and unequal access to education. It's also just a really, really fun read. If you're interested in checking out Unseen Academicals or any other Discworld story, and I would very, very highly recommend and checking them out, you can do that with a free month of Audible, my sponsor for this video. Basically, Audible is a service that lets you listen to thousands of really cool audiobooks of basically every single genre imaginable. You can also get stuff from Audible's Plus catalog, which includes podcasts, audiobooks, sleep and fitness tracks, and Audible originals you can't listen to anywhere else. That said, my recommendation is still absolutely Unseen Academicals and just the Discworld series in general. The audiobooks were my first access point for Discworld, and I'm really grateful 
grateful for that because they're just so cozy and compelling. If you're interested in exploring Audible and listening to some really cool audiobooks, you can get a free 30-day trial at audible.com slash Z or by texting Z to 500-500. On top of a big thank you to all my patrons, I'd like to specially thank Just Call Me Silent, Benson Lai, and Sarah Jafari. Thank you so much and welcome. On top of a big thank you to all my patrons, I'd like to specially thank Just Call Me Silent, Benson Lai, and Sarah Jafari. Thank you so much and welcome.